always good to be with the Saints. I'm I'm uh, thankful to be in your number again after having been ill for some time, uh, a lot longer than I expected, and uh, that's unfortunate. Sorry about that, and I'll do the best that I can to speak clearly and not blow my nose into the microphone. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, have given a, a lot of thought to what we are doing as the church uh, coming together and what we're doing as the people of God and how we do these things and how we can improve these things. And uh, so I, I wanted to go back to the basic ideas of worship in part with singing, um, which we look at this morning. I was able this last week to find some uh, software that allows that allowed me to generate the musical notation, I guess, for for songs. And so I, I took one of the. You might be familiar, and you may not be familiar, but in our song books, these hymns for worship, I guess they're called. Uh, there are actually a number of psalms in there in the back in the index, and they are just. Uh, like paraphrased in kind of paragraph format after some of the other songs. Like I know 531A is an example, just because I happen to remember. Um, and they'll give you like the, the hymn uh, whose tune they borrowed, I guess, when they made that paraphrase. But it's hard, I found, to lead singing from that paragraph because it's kind of hard to tell where they intend for the lines to break and you know when you hold a word or when you don't hold a word you know that kind of thing it's like yeah it's got to be an easier way so i found some software that would let me uh enter the melody you know the the musical line from the the uh song at hand and also enter the words that had been provided in paragraph form in, in the songbook and, and have those set side by side. So now uh, I made one of them and it seemed to work. It looked readable. At least Emily said it did, or maybe she was just trying to make me feel better. Um, and uh, I think then I'm going to try to make as many of them as I can of the ones whose lyrics or whose um, melodies uh, uh, I think that we know and see if I can put those together for us before uh, next week so that we can use them uh, to sing, because they're the Psalms. And one of the things that occurred to me in thinking about the worship of uh, that, that the church does uh, is, you know, we have, <clears throat> we have a song book provided by God himself, you know, in the Psalms. <laughs> and yet, uh, a relatively small number of them have actually been put to melody and incorporated in our songbook. Um, the ones, you know, even the ones that it provides, um, you know, in the, in the format that we were just discussing are relatively few in number when you consider there are 150 songs. So, uh, it has occurred to me that we really, you know, it seems like an obvious thing to me that we ought to have paraphrases of many more psalms than we do and find a way to set those to the melodies that are in the book. So uh, if anybody feels like joining me in that quest, uh, I'll take you up on help. Um, but I don't know what it will look like if I try to do it by myself. Might take a long time. But I'm going to start with the ones that are actually in the book already, or somebody's already paraphrased it with a target uh, melody in mind, and just try to put those into a format that we'll be able to use them. Um, supplements are all the rage these days, I've noticed. Um, <laughs> so we can make a South Austin supplement. And if anybody knows anything about copyright law, I think I would like to hear about that too. Um, I don't think that there would be anything wrong with us taking, you know, we've already bought these books and they came with, use this melody for these words. 
I would think making a print of those words with that melody for this church to use, not to put on the internet or whatever, and for not any, for no performance purposes, just as part of our worship, I would think that's no different from just turning to those pages in our songbook and singing. So I don't think that there's going to be an issue there. <clears throat> and of course, we would never support the idea of performing these songs, uh, you know, recording them, whatever. That's not the idea. These are what we're singing in worship to God. But I thought the Psalms would be a good thing. I mean, God gave us that songbook and we ought to use it, right? That kind of makes sense. It seems like an obvious thing to me anyway. And I don't even believe in obvious. So Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is the lesson today. And that starts um, to the two important passages about worship with music. In the New Testament, there it's Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, as you may already know. But it's worth looking at them, see what they say, and see what they don't say. Understand, you know, understand the structure of what's being outlined for us here, and how do you do this? And that informs how we worship God with song as we are doing. I don't say it because I think that we have done or are doing or are proposing anything that is wrong. Just go back to the simple teaching, let it pres prescribe what we are to do and understand that as the authority of God for this matter. So it's Ephesians chapter 5 in that second half of the 18th verse to the end of the 19th verse, just these two, he says, be filled with the spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. This is the thing that is outlined in Ephesians 5 for how the church conducts itself. There are a lot of things in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, you know, at the beginning, he talks about the church imitating God as his dear children, in purity. Um, he speaks about the church keeping aloof from error. You know, at Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather even expose them, um, you know, bring things to light. Uh, among the things, you know, and then later he describes the church as the bride of Christ and likens the relationship of the church and its God to the relationship of the wife and her husband. Uh, especially in the sense that the husband loves the wife and gives himself on behalf of the, the wife the way that Jesus loves the church and gave himself on our behalf. Um, this is kind of the emphasis that he's making there. In that context, there is also this indication of how uh, we worship, which is... In music here, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with the heart. We are filled with the Spirit when we do this, and that doesn't mean, I don't think it means the Holy Spirit, even though the English Standard Version capitalized the letter S, but maybe it does, uh, insofar as we're filled with things that are directed by the Holy Spirit, i.e. the Word of God or meditations on His Word, His teaching. But we're addressing one another, he says. That's saying that when we are doing this singing, that we, of course, are singing and making melody to the Lord from the heart or with the heart. But we also, in so doing, are addressing one another. So we have our, you know, if you will, those are the words leaving the mouth. That The words of the song are intended for one another in some sense, as well as for God in worship from the heart. We're addressing one another. Um, this is telling you, of course, that everybody sings, and that, you know, every person who is part of the Lord's assembly, God's church, the, the church of Christ, is singing. We're addressing one another. And the things we are singing are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
and that we are also singing, making melody to the Lord with the heart. That we are also not just addressing one another, but also lifting this to God, and it's from the heart. Uh, the structure here, I've diagrammed it a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Is this be filled with the spirit is the main thing. And it actually, um, without getting too far afield, there is a way in the original language, the Greek of the New Testament, to identify the main uh, action, which is the container for all the other things that, that follow. So the main thing is that we are filled with the spirit. And that consists of two things in this passage. The first thing is addressing one another, and the second thing is singing and making melody. So the big picture is we're filled with the Spirit, meaning the things of God, right? Things that matter to God, spiritual matters. And that consists of our addressing one another and our singing and making melody. Those are the, the major points here, that when we ourselves have the word of God in us or are full of the teaching of the Lord, we also can espouse it. It's almost like your heart overflows with the teaching of God and that that comes from the mouth <laughs> in the singing. When we address one another, furthermore, that also is something of a container that has these three things in it, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, it is prescribed what we use to address one another. It's going to be the Psalms. It's also going to be something called hymns and something called spiritual songs. The Psalms, we know what they are. There are 150 of them. They're in your Bible. Um, so I'm not going to explain that very much. Hymns, uh, we, can, we can look at that in more detail in a little bit, but basically... Hymn is a Greek word, and it means a song of praise, a glorification, uh, something that is praising God or extolling his greatness or his virtue or his goodness or giving thanks to him. You know, something basically that's addressed to him about his goodness, his greatness, our thankfulness to him, the great works that he has done. And the third category of things is spiritual songs. And these are just songs, but they're songs of a spiritual nature. They're not just today's, you know, pop songs, <laughs> you know, uh, the greatest hits of the 60s and 70s, you know. Like, no, that's, that's not what we're singing <laughs> in worship to God. That's not what we're using to address one another. It's a spiritual song, meaning a song that has a spiritual, spiritual content. It's thinking about something. That is a spiritual teaching, um, perhaps right living, a meditation on God's word of some kind. Um, Psalms, as we say, are just prescribed, right? There's, they're in the book. You, you got 150 of them. You know what they are. We can paraphrase them to make them fit melody, and that's basically what's what we talked about at the beginning here. Hymns are addressed directly to God. We praise thee, O God is a fairly obvious example of a hymn. <laughs> uh, spiritual songs could be things like um, love one another, you know, angry words or let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. That's a spiritually minded thought, something that is fueled by scripture and supported by scripture. And so we use that to encourage and admonish one another, addressing one another with that. That's a valid song. Singing and making melody. Well, here I will stop for a minute and get a little crazy uh, with the Greek because there's a little craziness in the world. Actually, what this says is singing and strumming your heart to the Lord. <laughs> and you strum your heart. Yeah. Well, literally, no, there are not strings, even though we talk of the heart strings. <laughs> there are no literal strings in the heart and nobody can hear your heart outside of you know, outside of you, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's clearly a metaphor, um, a comparison, figure of speech, 
right? And I know it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for people to understand a figure of speech. I know. Um, but it is. It's clearly a figure of speech. So you're making melody with your heart. Well, your heart's not an instrument. You can't actually strum it. Right. It's just a figure of speech that the that you're playing your heart, that you're singing your heart out, maybe is the, the way we would translate that. <laughs> but it's heartfelt is the idea. It touches you. You mean it, right? That's the idea. And God is worshipped with the heart. That's the thing that is offered to the Lord. Heart worship, sometimes it's called. He's worshipped with our heart, like what we intend, what we're thinking about. So um, let me also go back over this from the perspective of a, a uh, I guess, a proscription. As in what is not allowed? Well, we talked a little bit about the greatest hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Those are not allowed. There are no psalms or hymns or spiritual songs among the greatest hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Right? But psalms, I think, is fairly clear. Hymns of worship to God, they have to be accurate, though. You can't ascribe to God things that are not true about God <laughs> and put that in a song and a pretty melody, and that makes it okay. Eh, no, no, it has to be accurate. <laughs> Spiritual songs especially, I think there's a lot of leeway in what a spiritual song is and, and how, you, um, how you sing something that has a spiritual intent behind it and a teaching that is sound. You, the, the congregation has a way of knowing this. You can read the song and see if what it's saying and what it's calling for is indeed uh, in keeping with the Bible. And is good and uplifting and, and is right to be offered up because it's not just for one another, although it is, it's for God. It has to be the best. We're offering worship to him. It's got to be something that's actually good, something that he would actually approve. Not that we aren't always doing that with the words of our lips, right? But you get the idea. It can't just be anything, you know, Mindless repetition of words that have very little meaning or content to them is not a spiritual song. You got to think about that. Maybe that's not one to sing. That's not one to lead. What does it teach? What does it address? Um, why would you say that to somebody? So those are things to think about too. There are there are some things that can be put into word and verse, or that can be put into verse and melody that could be sung that you just wouldn't. Why would you do that? How does it accomplish the purpose here, being filled with the Spirit? On the other hand, we have the singing and the making melody with the heart. Again, there is actually this idea of um, the plucking or the strumming that's inherent in the word psalm, and it's inherent in the word melody. So sometimes people will come here and say, well, it does here call upon us to pluck, and that refers to strings, and it's true that the word psalm has at it, as its root a pluck because David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, plucked a harp. That is true. However, Greek has a very uh, clear and a very concrete way, well, a very clear and concrete way of doing everything. It's kind of funny sometimes, but uh, has a very clear and concrete way of identifying what instrument is being played. And in this passage, that instrument is the heart. <laughs> yes, it says to play or pluck, but what it says to pluck is your heart. <laughs> and that necessarily tells you God has actually specified an instrument for us to play. We do have instrumental music. The instrument is your heart. <laughs> he told you to strum your heart. Literally. And I think that would be an okay rendering in a translation. I don't know why the translators think, well, we're so smart, we can figure it out and put it into a different language. Let everybody else figure it out. Just translate it. <laughs> they can figure it out the same way you can. In fact, probably better, frankly. But there is an instrument. The instrument is the heart. I'm for instrumental music. Right? As long as the instrument is the one that God specified, 
your heart. Some other instrument is not specified. In fact, it's contrary to the one that's specified. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I can play a guitar and also make melody in my heart. Well, that might be true. But how are you fulfilling the commandment to sing and make melody using the heart? How are you fulfilling the commandment to address one another with a thing that is lifeless? A string, a guitar, a, a, a flute, a drum. What does that, how does that address a person? It doesn't make sense. It can't fulfill the commandment. I understand people do these things, but what does it actually call for? What well, calls for you to be filled with the spirit? Where did the spirit in this book or any other book of the New Testament prescribe for the church? that it should use some other kind of music. How can you be filled with the Spirit, and yet the Spirit says nothing about any other instrument besides the heart? It can't be done. It's just a simple matter in that regard. Now over uh, Colossians 3, let's look at the other one, which is a very similar passage, <clears throat> and therefore is a good comparison. Here in Colossians 3.16, the same apostle says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Again, um, you can see fairly plainly that there is a... Um, There's a high affinity between these two passages. They're very similar to one another. And here the word of Christ dwells in you and richly, as in, in its fullness, overflowing. And if that word is within you, in your heart, then it comes out in this form, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So again, that word of Christ in us, when it is rich, when it is overflowing, it overflows in this form. We sing, and in so doing, we teach and admonish one another. The thing that we sing, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, the exact same wording as the other one. And we do this with thankfulness in the heart to the Lord God. And I've also diagrammed this one, if you will, or broken it apart. This also has, uh, it doesn't just bear a superficial resemblance to the other passage. It actually bears a structural resemb resemblance to the other passage. The main idea is let the word dwell in you. That's the big container here for all the other stuff that happens inside of it. The next things inside of that container, there's two. One is teaching and admonishing one another, and the other is singing. So what it is to let the word of Christ dwell richly within us, in this context, is to teach and admonish one another and to sing. Which is very similar to the Ephesians 5 passage, saying, but, um, you know, let each be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another and singing. The teaching and admonishing here follows with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as before. But it's interesting to me to see teaching and admonishing. That, that gets to me a little bit tighter than addressing one another. Not only is it intended for the other people, as well as for God, but also it is to be the kind of content that teaches on the one hand and admonishes on the other. Teaching is like the, you know, the positive statement of here's what you should do. Here's what is good. Here's right. You know, setting this forth. Admonishing is like warning. So also maybe things that should be avoided, um, like angry words. Oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip would be an admonishment. And that makes the requirement 
even more difficult for a mechanical instrument of music, I think. Uh, maybe, you know, a really good trumpeter could aim that bell right between your eyes and address you with his trumpet. <laughs> maybe you could make that argument. But he certainly can't teach and he can't admonish. There's no teaching, there's no warning that comes from the sounds made by any mechanical instrument. It doesn't have the ability to do this. That requires a soul. <laughs> it's a lifeless thing, a soulless thing, but you are not. You have a soul, you are alive. <laughs> and singing is also in this passage with thankfulness, with the heart, and for the God. So we're lifting it up to God. It's in the heart. There's thankfulness, which is actually grace, by the way, which is why we use the term say grace. You talk about saying grace at a meal. What you mean is giving thanks to God. <clears throat> because grace and thanks are very close to the same thing in Spanish. You have, you know, gracias, the, the graces. Um, singing with grace in the heart is an interesting way of thinking about melody. And then um, I charted them. I hope you can see it. But if you put these passages side by side, you can see that they compare quite favorably, as we said earlier. But in the same way that Ephesians 5 says, be filled with the Spirit, <clears throat> Colossians 3 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So where Ephesians would say, be filled with, Colossians would say, let it dwell in you richly. Are those not the same thing? I think those are the same thing. If in Ephesians we're filled with the spirit, in Colossians we're filled with the word of Christ, isn't the spirit the word of God? Yes. Does not the spirit give us the word? of Christ, the words of scripture, yes. Is that not the same thing? It is. Those are basically the same thing. Where Ephesians says we are addressing one another, Colossians says we are teaching and admonishing one another. So there, it seems to me those are compatible. Um, we're, we're not we are addressing one another in Ephesians, and he's calling us to be filled with the Spirit. So it seems fairly clear that you wouldn't address with something that has no real Bible content, no real Bible teaching in it. That wouldn't fulfill the command. What does fulfill it is teaching and admonishing. Colossians spells out quite clearly. And I think, again, Colossians makes it clear that it has to be words, and they have to be good words. And this is done to one another. We're addressing one another or we're teaching and admonishing one another. That is, the target here is one another, but the heart is lifted to God as well. It makes perfect sense in the light of the Bible when you think about the great commands, to love your neighbor as yourself and to love the Lord your God. We have this concern for one another who, as we travel through life here, and we have a concern for God in heaven too, at the same time. And our, we're doing both services um, simultaneously by this one action of worshiping appropriately, right? admonishing one another, playing the heart, you know, the heartfelt genuineness of the teaching thinking of each other as we teach the things we sing. We've talked about psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. We sing. They're in complete unity on these things. That we are singing, we're addressing one another, and that the thing we're singing is psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's very, very much identical. <clears throat> and they're almost identical at the bottom there with Ephesians saying we sing to the Lord and Colossians saying we sing to God, Ephesians saying we sing or strum the heart, play the heart, and Colossians saying 
we're singing to God in the heart. As that's the same. Ephesians says we are making melody or plucking, psalming, literally. And Colossians says we are singing with grace or thankfulness. I think that the graceful melody of the heart is thankfulness, right? The graceful melody of the heart is that heart that reaches out to God. And so, you know, this tells us what God intends, why we're, you know, why we're doing it, what is being accomplished by it. It leads us to, you know, conclude that the content controls. We're, we're filled with the Spirit, or the Word of Christ dwells in us richly. That's the major premise that controls everything that has to do with singing. Every other thing you look at in the New Testament that's talking about singing in worship, it's these two passages. The singing, the making melody, the teaching, those are all um, sub-points. The major point is be filled with the Spirit and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's, the, that's what you're doing. The song is the outpouring of those things. That tells us, well, a lot of things. The worship is for God. The mention of melody here is not for one another. <laughs> what is for one another? The address and the teaching and admonishing is for one another. Uh, the melody is for God. The grace in the heart is for God because God can read the heart. Uh, you know, the content is what's at issue. If you're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, if you will, or things inspired, if you're talking about the word of Christ dwelling within you richly, you're talking about content. What does it say? What does it contain? What does it mean? What is it calling us to do? That's what defines a song that is appropriate in the worship of God. You do not see here any mention of <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the, the musical abilities of the congregation, whether that be the participants or the leaders or whatever it might be. There's, that's not part of this. Um, you know, God is listening to your heart, even if your vocal cords don't make what people would think of as pleasant sounds. The sounds are not for people. The words are for people. They understand the words that you are singing, then they are getting what they're supposed to be getting from the worship. God is worshipped from the heart. And I think that's good. It's, it's um, liberating because we sometimes have no control over what it sounds like when we sing. People's voices are in different states of repair and disrepair. People's musical abilities or ears' ability to distinguish tones are different, sometimes from birth, sometimes from other things that happen in life. If we were being judged on those physical characteristics, that would be kind of terrifying. <laughs> but we're not. We're being judged on the heart before God, and we're being judged on the mind to address and teach and admonish. What song you sing? That's being called into question, yeah. Because what is it and what's in it? It doesn't fulfill the commandment. How do you sing? What do you use to sing with? That matters. That's being judged, yes. But those are things that we can do. Those are things that are in our control. Hmm. Well, I think that we're going to stop there. <clears throat> As we're, again, looking at the basics of the worship.
I was looking for the end slideshow button. Sorry, I lost it. But I found it. Okay. The purpose of this is just to think again about how we're worshiping God. It's something that we are doing even today and are about to enter into again. And this idea of the song that it has been selected, we call an invitation song. I guess that's an accommodative way of thinking about the invitation to obey God. That is God's invitation, heaven's invitation. But it is a very appropriate method of worship. It's something whose words are calling on everybody to do the will of God, to um, to make things right in their own lives individually. And is intended to address, to teach, to admonish. And those words are selected for that purpose, for that aim, which is a godly purpose and a godly aim. You can see in the New Testament, everywhere somebody starts preaching Jesus, people start getting baptized. That's how it works, always is. The reason is that Jesus lived uh, for us, but he also died for us. And in giving his life, he was, he was buried, but he did not stay there. He was also raised from the dead and broke forth from that grave, a resurrected Jesus, a resurrected Lord. And you become like him if you change your heart to serve God from now on by putting to death your person who is sinful in baptism for forgiveness of sins. That is where the old person dies and the new person is resurrected from the dead. A new person in Christ Jesus, a Christian. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, if you uh, confess him as the son of God, if you are you know, changed in your heart from now on, I'm going to serve the Lord. Then you, you are a person who needs to obey him in baptism, as is recorded in Acts 2.38 and other places. Repent. And let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Having done this, you are a Christian, a child of God, and you have the audience of the Lord God in prayer through Jesus. If as a Christian, you have not continued in the way that you started, you also must repent and decide from now on, I'm serving God. I'm coming back and doing right again. And if that is your situation, we are happy to pray with you and for you to be restored to him in his service. Every one of us needs prayers from time to time. Nobody has succeeded in achieving a perfect and sinless life. That doesn't exist. We're not saying it does. But we do want to help one another on. If today you need the prayers of the saints as a Christian already, or if today you need to become a Christian, let your need be known in the spirit by coming to the front while together we stand and sing.